Hey, Kent and Harry Potter addict, you were first. You are an addict. Just gonna wait for everybody to log on. Here's little Dexy. Hey. Hi, man, the mood. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Zenos. Hello, 204 Angel. Mark's here. Mark's right over there. Baboom. Let's do this. Welcome, everybody. Hello, uh, Emi. Ska version, yep. That's what I found for today. Salut! Salut! <laughs> I'm saying that right. Ruben. Hello, Jack One N and Iman Amud. Yeah, he's just chilling. Little guy's just chilling. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Harry Potter reading. I'm gonna have more chill music on happening. Uh, those of you who <laughs> who uh, are tuning in for the first time, those of you who have already been here, you've heard it all before, I'm gonna say it every single time. Uh, I am reading one hour of Harry Potter every day to take your mind off things, to give some relaxation and laughs. Um, never read these before. I have um, seen only the first two movies and one of the last ones a long while ago. I don't remember anything really. Um, I read all the comments that you write down, but I can't read them at the same time when I'm reading the book. So please, no spoilers for me or other people in there, and that means uh, also not, not don't hint at anything. Oh, just wait till or anything like that. Um, and if you do spoil something for for me, I'm gonna call you out next time if that happens. <laughs> uh, please keep it above above board for kids who are also reading along and viewing along. Um, so please no swearing, you can make jokes and stuff like that, but just be subtle about it, you know, nothing too overt. Um, I'm having a QA and a at the end, so if you have any questions for me, you know, keep them for the end or you can write them during. Um, and I also, oh yeah, I saved all of these on YouTube and I will continue to do so every night. So uh, if you want to catch up, they're on YouTube, just search my name, John Voth, and there I am. One last thing, um, I, I'm thinking, what should I call this thing? Yeah, throw some example, uh, some example, some suggestions in there, and I'll uh, pick pick my favorite out. Maybe I'll give my giveaway my glasses or something. We'll figure it out. But um, yeah, if you know have any names for it, throw it in there. Okay, so where are we? We're on page hundred and one of this book. If you're reading along, and currently he has been going to different classes at Hogwarts, discovering different teachers, and. Um, yeah, just experiencing the, the, the first couple of classes there. So, and he's going to go see Hagrid at the end of this, at the end of the day. Okay, here we go. Middle of page 101. At the start of term banquet, Harry had got the idea that Professor Snape disliked him. By the, oh, oh, by the way, I'm calling um, Snape Slytherin Snoop because I thought that was his name before I read the books. So he's always, he's always uh, Slytherin Snoop for me. By the end of the first uh, potions lesson, he knew he'd been wrong. Snoop didn't like to Harry, dislike Harry, he hated him. Potions lessons took place down in one of the dungeons. It was colder, colder here than up in the main castle, and, and would have been quite creepy enough without the pickled animals floating in glass jars all around the walls. Snoop, like Flitwick, started the class by taking the, <laughs> taking the register, and like Flitwick, he paused at Harry's name. So I know how he sounds because of Alan Rickman and, you know, clips that have floated around. So I'm going to try and do him. Ah, oh, yes, he said softly. Harry Potter, our new celebrity. Let me know if that's good. That's good? Okay. Dra Draco Malfoy and his friends Crabbe and Goyle <laughs> sniggered behind their hands. Snoop finished calling the names and looked up at the class. His eyes were black like Hagrid's, but they had none of Hagrid's warmth. They were cold and empty and made you think of dark tun tunnels. You are here to learn the subtle science and exact art of potion making, he began. He spoke in barely more than a whisper, but they caught every word, like Professor McGonagall. Snoop had the gift of keeping a class silent without effort. As there is little foolish wand waving here, many of you will hardly believe this is magic. 
I don't expect you will really understand the beauty of the softly simmering cauldron with its shimmering fumes, the delicate power of liquids that creep through human veins, bewitching the mind, ensnaring the senses. I can teach you how to bottle fame, brew glory, even stop our death if you aren't as big a bunch of dunderheads as I usually have to teach. More silence followed this little speech. Harry and Ron exchanged looks with raised eyebrows. Hermione Granger was on the edge of her seat and looked desperate to start proving that she wasn't a dunderhead. Potter, said Snape suddenly. What would I get if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood? Powdered root of what to an infusion of what? Harry glanced at Ron, who looked as stumped as he was. Hermione's hand shot into the air. I, I don't know, sir, said, said Harry. Snape's lips curled into a sneer. Tup, tup, fame clearly isn't everything. He, he ignored Hermione's hand. Let's try again, Potter. Where, where would you look if I told you to find me a bezoar? Hermione stretched her hand as high into the air as it would go without her leaving her seat. But Harry didn't have the faintest idea what a, a bezoar, 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 it's one of those things, huh? He tried not to look at Malfoy, Carbet, and Goyal, who were shaking with laughter. I, I don't know, so, sir. Thought you wouldn't open a book before coming, eh, Potter? Harry forced himself to keep looking straight into, the, into those cold eyes. He had looked through his books, books at the Dursleys, but did Snape expect him to remember everything in 1,000 magical herbs and fungi? Snape was still ignoring Hermione's quivering hand. <laughs> She's like, oh, please! <laughs> what is the difference, Potter, between Monk's Hood and Wolf's Bane? At this, Hermione stood up, her hand stretching towards the dungeon ceiling. I don't know, said Harry quietly. I think Hermione does, though why don't you try her? A few people laughed. Harry caught Seamus's eye, and Seamus winked. Snape, however, was not pleased. Shut down, he said, snapped at Hermione. For your information, Potter, Asphodel and Wormwood make a sleeping person so powerful it is known as the draught of living death. A bezoar is a stone taken from the stomach of a goat, and it will save you from most poisons. As for monkshood and wolfsbane, they are the same plant, which also goes by the name of a conite. Well, why aren't you all copying that down? Um, for once I'm not late, but half my messages don't send. No, I read them. I got it. There was a sudden rummaging for yours. Okay, thank you. There was a sudden rummaging for quills and parchment. Over the noise, Snape said, S uh, Snoop said, And a point will be taken from Gryffindor house for your cheek, Potter. Things didn't improve for the Gryffindors as the potions lessons continued. S uh, Snoop... Okay, I'm going to do this for a little bit, but I know everybody's going to hate it, so I'll go back to Snape eventually. Don't worry. <laughs> Snoop put them all into pairs and set them to, um, to mixing up a simple potion to cure boils. He swept around in his long, black cloak, watching them weigh dried nettles and crush snake fangs, criticizing almost everyone except Malfoy, whom he seemed to like. He was just telling everyone to look at the perfect way Malfoy had stewed his horn slugs when clouds of acid green smoke and a loud hissing filled the dungeon. Neville had some... Ha <laughs> ha! Neville, you klutz! You oaf, Neville! You are such an oaf! Neville had some, uh, somehow managed to melt Seamus's cauldron into a twisted blob, and their potion was seeping across the stone floor, burning holes in people's shoes. Within seconds, the whole class were, stand, were standing on their stools, while Neville, who had been drenched in the potion when the cauldron collapsed, moaned in pain as angry red boils sprang up all over his arms and legs. Idiot boy, snarled, snarled Snape, clearly, clearly, clearing the spilled potion away with one wave of his hand. I suppose you added the porcupine quills before taking the cauldron off the fire, Neville whimpered as boils started to pop up all over his nose. Take him up to the hospital wing, Snape spat at Seamus. Then he round, rounded on Harry and Ron, who had been working next to Neville. Oh, favorite character is Ron. You, Potter, 
Why didn't you tell him not to add the quills? Thought he'd make you look good if he got it wrong, did you? That's another point you've lost for Gryffindor. This was so unfair that Harry, Harry opened his mouth to argue, but Ron kicked him behind their cauldron. Don't push it, he muttered. I've heard Snape can turn very nasty. As they climbed the steps out of the dungeon an hour later, Harry's mind was racing and his spirits were low. He'd lost two points for Gryffindor in his very first week. Why did Snape hate, hate him so much? Cheer up, said Ron. Snape's always talking, uh, taking points off Fred and George. Can I come and meet Hagrid with you? At five to three, they left the castle and made their way across the grounds. Hagrid lived in a small wooden house on the edge of the Forbidden Forest. A crossbow and a pair of uh, galoshes were outside the front door. When Harry knocked, they heard a frantic scrabbling from inside and several booming barks. Then Hagrid's voice rang out, saying, uh, what was his voice again? Back, back, Frank, back! Hagrid's big hairy face appeared in the crack as he pulled the door open. Hang on, he said, back, Fang! He let them in, struggling to keep a hold in the collar of an enormous black boar hound. Uh, the uh, couple of drinks to the auth authenticity. Okay. Um, there was only one room inside. Hams and pheasants were hanging from the ceiling. A copper kettle was boiling on the open fire. And in the corner stood a massive bed with a patchwork quilt over it. Make yourselves at home, said Hagrid, letting go of Fang, who, who bounded straight at Ron and started licking his ears. Like Hagrid, Fang was clearly not as fierce as he looked. Uh, this is Ron, Harry told Hagrid, who was pouring boiling water into a large teapot and putting rock cakes onto a plate. <laughs> Wait, is that another British thing, rock cakes? Or is that an actual thing from the book? Rock cakes. Another Weasley, eh? Said Hagrid, glancing at Ron's freckles. I spent half my life chasing your twin brothers away from the forest. The rock cakes almost broke their teeth, but Harry and Ron pretended to be enjoying them as, the, as they told Hagrid all about their first lessons. Fang rested, rested his head on Harry's knee and drooled all over his robes. Harry and Ron were delighted to hear Hagrid call Filch, that old git. And, f and as for that cat, Mrs. Norse, I'd like to introduce her to, to Fang sometime. You know, uh, do you know, every time I go up to her, uh, to her the school, she follows me everywhere. Can't get rid of her. Filch puts her up to it. Harry told Hagrid about Snape's lesson. Hagrid, like Ron, told Harry not to worry about it, that Snoop likely hardly, liked hardly any of the students. But he seemed to really hate me. Rubbish, said Hagrid. Why should he? Yet Harry couldn't help thinking that Hagrid didn't quite meet his eyes when he said that. How's your brother, Charlie? Hagrid asked Ron. I liked him a lot. Great with animals. Harry wondered if Hagrid had changed the subject on purpose. While Ron told Hagrid all about Charlie's work with dragons, Harry picked up a piece of paper that was lying on, on the table under, under the tea cozy. It was cutting from the Daily Prophet. Uh, rock cakes are real? I don't know, it might be. Small tea biscuits. Similar to scones. Oh, okay. So they're real. They're real. Hola. Harry wondered if Hagrid had changed the subject on purpose. While Ron told Hagrid... Oh, so, okay. He picked up the paper. Um, it was a cutting from the Daily Prophet. Gringotts break in latest. Investigations continue into the break-in at Gringotts on 31 July. Widely, be widely to be believed to be the work of dark wizards or witches unbeknown. Gringotts goblin today insisted that nothing had been taken. The vault that was searched had in, had in fact been emptied the same day. But we're not telling you what was in there, so keep your noses out if you know what's good for you, said a Gringotts spoke up on this afternoon. A any signs or newspapers I'm reading in a 40 voice. Harry remembered Ron telling him on the train that somehow someone had tried to rob Gringotts, but Gr Gringotts, but Ron hadn't mentioned the date. Hag Hagrid, said Harry, that Gringotts break-in happened on my birthday. It might have been happening while we were, well, while we were there. There was, no d there was no doubt about it. Hagrid definitely didn't meet Harry's eyes this time. He grunted and offered him another rock cake. Harry read the story again. The vault that was searched had in fact been emptied earlier that same day. Hagrid had emptied Vault 713, if you could call it emptying, taking out that grubby little package. Had that been what the thieves were looking for? 
As Harry and Ron walked back to the castle for dinner, their pockets weighed, weighed, uh, weighed down with rock cakes they'd been too polite to refuse. Harry thought that none of the lessons he'd had so far had given him as much to think about as tea with Hagrid. Had Hagrid collected that package just in time? Where was it now? And did Hagrid know something about Snoop that he didn't want to tell Harry? <laughs> what if, uh, what if she's playing on, you know, raw cakes of the, those tea, real tea biscuits, but what if Hagrid doesn't know that and just makes real rock cakes? Like, they're breaking their tea, teeth on them. <laughs> they're like, it's not, that's not a rock cake, Hagrid. <laughs> well, I know, I know what a rock cake is. <laughs> End of that chapter. Uh, chapter 9. The Midnight Duel. Harry had never believed he would meet a boy he hated more than Dudley, but that was before he met Draco Malfoy. Still, first year Gryffindors only had potions with the Slytherins, Slytherins. So they didn't have to put up with Malfoy much, or at least they didn't until they spotted a notice pinned up in the Gryffindor common room, which made them all groan. Flying lessons would be starting starting on Thursday, and Gryffindor and Slytherin would be learning together. Typical, said Harry darkly. Just what I always wanted, to make a fool of myself on a broomstick, broomstick in front of Malfoy. He had been looking forward to learning to fly more than any, anything else. Is it that Ron? You don't think you'll make a fool of yourself, said Ron reasonably. Anyway, I know Malfoy is always going on about how good he is at Quidditch, but I bet that's all talk. Malfoy certainly didn't, did talk about flying a lot. He complained loudly about first years never, get, never getting on the house Quidditch teams and told long, boastful stories which always seemed to end with him narrowly, narrowly, narrowly <laughs> escaping muggles in helicopters. What? Stu's rich. Comes from a rich family. He wasn't the only one, though. The way Seamus Finnegan told it, he'd spent most of his childhood zooming around the countryside on the broomstick. Even Ron would tell anyone who'd listen about the time he'd almost hit a hand glider on Charlie's old broom. Everyone from wizarding families talked about Quidditch constantly. Ron had already had a big argument with Dean Thomas, who shared their do dormitory about football. Ron couldn't see what was exciting about a game with only one ball where no one was allowed to fly. Harry caught Ron prodding Dean's poster of West Ham football team, trying to make the players move. Neville had never been on a broomstick in his life because his grandmother had never let him near one. Privately, Harry felt she had a good, good reason because Neville managed to have an extraordinary number of accidents, even with both feet on the ground. That klutz. Hermione Granger was almost as nervous about flying as Neville was. This was something you couldn't learn by heart out of the book. Not that she hadn't tried. At breakfast on Thursdays, she bored them all stupid with flying tips she'd got out of a library book called Quidditch Through the Ages. Neville was hanging on to her every word, desperate for anything that might help him hang on to his broomstick later. But everybody else was very pleased when Hermione's lecture was interrupted by the arrival of the post. Harry hadn't had a single letter since Hagrid's note, something that Malfoy had been quick to notice, of course. Malfoy's eagle owl was always bringing him packages of sweets from home, which he opened gloatingly at the Slytherin table. A barn owl brought Neville a small package from his grandmother. Just, I'm just expecting something silly. He opened it excited, excitedly and showed them a glass ball the size of a large marble, which seemed to be full of white smoke. It's a Remembral. No, no, what's his name? It's, it's a Remembral, he explained. Gran knows I forget things. This tells you if there's something you've forgotten to do. Look. You hold it tight like this, and if it turns red, oh, his face fell because the Remembrall had suddenly glowed scarlet. You've forgotten something. Ne <laughs> Neville was trying to remember what he'd forgotten. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> the thing doesn't tell you what you've forgotten. It only tells you that you've forgotten something. <laughs> it's such a use. Like, it seems like his grandmother is also on the clutch side. Like, he he's got it from somewhere. Oh, heck and yeah, bro. Neville was trying to remember what he'd forgotten when Draco Malfoy, Malf Malfoy, who was passing the Gryffindor table, snatched the Remembrall out of his hand. Harry and Ron jumped to their feet. They were half hoping for a reason to fight Malfoy. But Professor McGonagall, who could spot trouble, trouble quicker 
than any teacher in the school was there in a flash. What's going on? Malfoy's got my remem- uh, Malfoy's got my rememberall, Professor. Scowling, Malfoy quickly dropped the rememberall remember back on the table. Just looking, he said, and he sloped away with Crabbe and Goyle behind him. At 3.30 uh, that afternoon, Harry, Ron, and the other Gryffindors hurried down the front steps into the grounds for their first flying lesson. It was a clear, breezy day, and the grass rippled under their feet as they marched down the sloping lawns toward a smooth lawn on the opposite side of the grounds to the forbidden forest, whose trees were swaying darkly in the distance. The Slytherins were already there, and so were twenty broomsticks lying in neat lines on the ground. Harry had heard Fred and George Weasley complain about the school brooms, saying that some of them started to vibrate if you flew too high, or always flew slightly to the left. Their teacher, Madame Hooch, arrived. She had short gray hair and yellow eyes like a hawk. All right, some adjectives for, for Madame Hooch. Uh, what, what is she like? You know, tell me what she's like. Uh, well, she's barking. Okay, she had short gray hair, yellow eyes like a hawk. Hawk! Well, what are you all waiting for? She barked. Everyone stand by a broomstick. Come on, hurry up. Harry glanced down at his broom. It was old and so some of those twigs stuck out at odd angles. No nonsense, like a coach. Okay. Stick out your right hand over your broom, called Madame Hooch the front, and say, up, up, everyone, sh up, everyone shouted. Harry's broom jumped into his hand at once, but it was one of the few that did. Hermione Granger's had simply rolled over on the ground. Ooh, that's embarrassing, Hermione. And Neville's hadn't moved at all. Of course not. Perhaps brooms, like horses, could tell when you were afraid, thought Harry. There was a, qua a quaver in Neville's voice that said one too clearly that he wanted to keep his feet on the ground. Uh, the Potter coach. Madame Hooch then showed them how to mount their brooms without sliding off the end, and walked up and down the rows correcting their grips. Harry and Ron were delighted when she told Malfoy he'd been doing it wrong for years. <laughs> now, when I blow my whistle, you kick off from the ground hard, said Madame Hooch. Keep your broom steady, rise a few feet, and then come straight back down by leaning towards slightly. On my, wh on my whistle, three, two... But Neville, nervous and jumpy and frightened of being left on the ground, <laughs> pushed up... <laughs> oh, Neville... Pushed up hard before the whistle had touched Madame Hooch's lips. Come back, boy, she shouted. But Neville was rising straight up like a cork shot out of a bottle. Twelve feet, twenty feet. Harry saw his scared white face look down at the ground, falling away. <laughs> saw him gasp, sli slip sideways off the broom, and wham! A thud and a nasty crack, and Neville lay face down on the grass in a heap. <laughs> His broomstick was still rising higher and higher and started to drift lazily towards the forbidden forest and out of sight. Uh, she needs to be sterner. Okay. Madame Hooch was bending over Neville, her face as white as his. Uh, broken wrist, Harry heard her mutter. Come on, boy. It's all right. Up you get. She turned to the rest of the class. None of you is to move while I take this boy to the hospital wing. You leave those brooms where they are, or you'll be out of Hogwarts before you can say Quidditch. Come on, dear. Neville, his fears, uh, his face tear-streaked, clutching his wrist, hobbled off with Madame Hooch, who had her arm around him. Ah, she's probably sweet. No sooner were they out of earshot than Malfoy burst into laughter. Did you see his face? The great lump. The other Slytherins joined in. Uh, Parvati Patil, I think he's Ital Italian. Shut up, Malfoy, snapped Parvati Patil. Pansy Parkinson, a uh, hard-faced Slytherin girl, girl, okay. Oh, sticking up the long bottom, said Pansy Parkinson, a hard-faced Slytherin gir girl. Never thought you'd like fat little crybabies, Parvati. Look, said Malfoy, darting forward and, s oh, Malfoy. Look, said Malfoy, darting forward and snatching something out of the glass, grass. It's that stupid thing Longbottom's grand sent him. The Remembra glittered in the sun as he held it up. Give that here, Malfoy, said Harry quietly. Everyone stopped talking to, uh, to watch. Malfoy smiled nastily. I'll think I'll leave it somewhere for Longbottom to collect. How about 
up a tree. Give it here, Harry yelled. But Malfoy had leapt onto his broomstick and taken off. He hadn't been flying. He could fly well. Hovering lev level with the topmost branches of an oak, he called, Come and get it, Potter. Harry grabbed his broom. No, shouted Hermione Granger. Madame Hooch told us not to move. You'll get us all in trouble. Harry ignored her. Blood was pounding in his ears. He mounted, yeah, Harry is, Harry's about to kick some butt. Some, got some courage in him. <laughs> Harry ignored her. Blood was pounding in his ears. He's about, uh, he, he mounted the, <laughs> okay. He mounted the broom and kicked hard against the ground and up, up he soared. Air rushed through his hair and his robes whipped out behind him. And in a rush of fierce joy, he realized he'd found something he could do without being taught. This was easy. This was wonderful. He pulled his broomstick up a little to take it up a little to take it even higher and heard screams and gasps of girls back on the ground and an admiring whoop from Ron. He turned his broomstick sharply to face Malfoy in midair. Malfoy looked stunned. Give it here, Harry called, or, or I'll knock you off that broom. Oh yeah, said Malfoy, trying to sneer, but looking worried. Harry knew somehow what to do. He leant forward and grasped the broom tightly in both hands, and it shot towards Malfoy like a javelin. Malvo Malvo Malfoy only just got out of the way in time. Harry made a sharp about turn and held the broom steady. A few people below were clapping. No, Crabbe and Goyle appear to save your neck, Malfoy, Harry called. The same thought seemed to have struck Malfoy. Catch it if you can, then, he shouted and he threw the glass ball high into the air and streaked back towards the ground. Harry saw, as though in slow motion, the ball rise up in the air and then start to fall. He leant forward and pointed his broom handle down. Next second, he was gathering speed in a steep dive, racing the ball. Wind whistled in his ears, mingled with the screams of people watching. He stretched out his hand. A foot from the ground, he caught it. Just in time to pull his broom straight, and he toppled gently onto the grass with the Remembrall clutched safely in his fist. Harry Potter! His heart sank faster than he'd just dived. Professor McGonagall was running towards them. He got to his feet, trembling. Uh, I don't care if you're done with it, Nathan. I'm going to keep on going with that joke. Never in all my time in, at Hogwarts... Profe Professor McGonagall was almost speechless with shock, and her glasses flashed furiously. How dare you! Might have broken your neck! It wasn't his fault, Professor. Be quiet, Miss Patil. Uh, but Malfoy, that's enough, Mr. Weasley. Potter, follow me. Now. Harry caught sight of Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle's triumphant faces as, as he left, walking numbly in Professor McGonagall's wake. As, he sh as she strode towards the castle. He was going to be expelled. He just knew it. He wanted to say something to defend himself, but there seemed to be something wrong with his voice. Professor McGonagall was sweeping along without even looking at him. He had to jog to keep up. Now he'd done it. He hadn't even lasted two weeks. He'd, been, he'd be packing his bags in ten minutes. What would the Dursleys say when he turned up on the doorstep? Up the front steps, up the marble stu uh, staircase inside, and still Professor McGonagall didn't say a word to him. She wrenched open doors and marched along corridors with Harry trotting miserably behind her. Maybe she was taking him to Dumbledore, he thought. He thought of Hagrid, expelled but allowed to stay on as a gamekeeper. Perhaps he could be Hagrid's assistant. His stomach twisted as he imagined it, watching Ron and the others becoming wizards while he stumped around the grounds carrying Hagrid's bag. Professor McGonagall stopped outside a classroom. She opened the door and poked her head inside. Excuse me, Professor Fitwick. Could I borrow wood for a moment? Wood, thought Harry, bewildered. Was wood a cane she was going to use, use on him? But wood turned out to be a person, a burly fifth-year boy who came out of Fl F Flitwick's class looking confused. Follow me, you two, said Professor McGonagall, and they marched up uh, on up the cor corridor. Wood looking curiously at Harry. In here, Professor McGonagall pointed them in, into a classroom, which was empty except for Peeves, who 
who was busy writing rude words on the blackboard. Got your conk! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Peeves. Out, Peeves! She barked. Peeves threw the chalk into a uh, bin, which clanged loudly, and he swooped out, cursing. Professor McGonagall slammed the door behind him and turned to face the two boys. Potter, this is Oliver Wood. Wood, I found you a seeker. Wood's expression changed from puzzlement to delight. Okay, adjectives for Wood. And uh, keep it above board, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what would you say is Wood like? He's like very successful jock guy. Okay. Very successful jock. Most Quidditch enthusiastic person ever, right. Are you serious, Professor? <laughs> like that kind of jock? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Sports bro. Sports bro, yeah. Okay, sports bro. But how does that... I know the American version of that sounds like the English... Uh, polite... Are, are you serious, Professor? <laughs> Absolute, absolutely, said Professor McGonagall crisply. The boy is a natural. I've never seen anything like it. Was that your first time on a broomstick, Potter? Harry nodded silently. He didn't have a clue what was going on, but he didn't seem to be to, to be being expelled, and some of the feelings started coming back to his legs. He caught that thing in his hand after a 50-foot dive, Professor McGonagall told Wood. Didn't even scratch himself. Charlie Weasley couldn't have done it. Wood was now looking as though all his dreams had come true at once. Ever, ever seen a game of Quidditch, Potter? He asked, ever seen a game of Quidditch, Potter? He asked excitedly. Wood's captain of the Gryffindor team, Professor McGon McGonagall explained. He's just the build for a seeker too, said Wood, now walking around Harry and staring at him. Light, speedy, we'll have to get, get him a decent broom, Professor. A Nimbus, uh, a Nimbus 2000 or a clean sweep seven, I'd say. All right, something like that. I shall speak to Professor B Professor Dumbledore and see if we can, can't bend the first year rule. Heaven knows we need a better team than last year. Flattened in that last match by Slytherin. I couldn't look Severus Snoop in the face for, for, for weeks. <laughs> for <laughs> <laughs> Professor McGonagall peered sternly over her glasses at Harry. I want to hear your training hard, Potter or I may change my mind about punching you. Then she suddenly smiled. Your father would have been proud, she said. He was an excellent Quidditch player himself. Uh, You're joking. It was dinner time. Minerva, who's Minerva? Wood, is Wood Minerva? Minerva Wood? Somebody's saying that Minerva's on point. Yeah, but yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. It was dinner time. Harry had just finished telling Ron what had happened when he'd left the grounds with Professor McGonagall. Ron had a piece of steak and kidney pie halfway to his mouth, <laughs> but he'd forgotten all about it. Seeker, he said, but first years never... You must be the youngest house player in about a century, said Harry, shoveling pie into his mouth. He felt particularly hungry after the excitement of the afternoon. Wood told me. Nerva is McGonagall. Oh, okay, gotcha. Ron was so amazed, so impressed, he just sat and gaped at Harry. I start training next week, said Harry. Only don't tell anyone. Wood wants to keep it a secret. Fred and George Weasley now came into the hall, spotted Harry, and hurried over. Uh, uh, George... Oh, it's one of the brothers. Well done, said George in a low voice. Oh, well done, said George in a low voice. Wood told us. We're on the team too. Beat us. So like this, this whole seeker beater thing, I hope that's explained because I don't know what it is. <laughs> I, I tell you, we're going to win that Quidditch Cup for sure this year, said Fred. We haven't won since Charlie left, but this year's team is going to be brilliant. You must be good, Harry. Wood was almost almost skipping when he told us. Anyway, we've got to go. Uh, I've got to find a difference in their voices because you'll never know who's speaking when. Yeah. Not really? Doesn't matter. I'll just... I changed the side of my mouth or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Oliver Wood is also Scottish. Okay. Anyway, we've got to go. Lee Jordan reckons he's found a new secret passageway out of the school. Bet it's, better that's, uh, bet it's that one behind the statue of Gregory, the smarmy that we found in our first week. See ya. 
Fred and George had hardly disappeared when someone far less welcome turned up, Malfoy, flanked by Crabbe and Goyelle. Having a last meal, Potter? When are you getting the train back to Muggles? Uh, you're a lot braver now you're back on the ground. And you've got your little friends with you, said Harry coolly. There was, there was, of course, nothing at all little about Crabbe and Goyelle. But as the high table was full of teachers, neither of them could do more than crack their knuckles and scowl. I take you on, on, on any time on my own, said Malfoy. Tonight, if you want, wizard's duel. Wands only, no contact. What's the matter? Never heard of wizard's duel before, I suppose? Of course he has. No, of course he has, said Ron, wheeling around. I'm his second. Who's yours? Malfoy looked at Crabbe and Goyelle, sizing them up. Crabbe, he said. Midnight, all right? We'll meet, we'll meet you in the trophy room. That's always unlocked. Ron might be from North England, but I could be wrong. Okay. When Malfoy had gone, Ron and Harry looked at each other. What is a wizard's, wizard's duel, said Harry. And what do you mean, you're my second? Well, a, a second's there to take over if you die, said Ron casually getting started at last on his cold pie. Catching the look on Harry's face, he added quickly, but people only die in proper duels, you know, with real wizards. The most you and Malfoy will be able to, to do is send sparks at each other. Neither of you knows it enough magic to do any real damage. I bet he expected you to refuse anyway. And what if I wave my hand and nothing happens? Throw it away and punch him in the nose, Ron <laughs> suggested. Excuse me? No, no, um, Hermione Granger. Excuse me? They both looked up. It was Hermione Granger. Can't a person eat in peace in this place? Said Ron. Hermione ignored him and spoke to Harry. I couldn't help overhear overhearing what you and Malfoy were saying. Bet you could, Ron muttered. And you mustn't go wandering around the school at night. Think of the points you'll lose Gryffindor if you're caught and, if you're, and you're bound to be. It's really selfish of you. And it's really none of your business, said Harry. Goodbye, said Ron. I don't have a wizard hat, Paul. I wish I did. Maybe I'll have to make a makeshift one. And yeah, maybe. maybe. I'll, I'll try and find one. All the same, it wasn't what you'd call the perfect end to the day, Harry thought, as he lay awake much later listening to Dean and she Seamus falling asleep. Neville wasn't back from the hospital wing. <laughs> Ron had spent all evening giving him advice, such as, if he tries to curse you, you'd better dodge it, because I can't remember how to block them. There was a very good chance they were going to get caught by Filch or Mrs. Norris, and Harry felt he was pushing his luck, breaking another school rule today. On the other hand, Malfoy's sneering face kept looming up out of the darkness. This was his big chance to beat Malfoy face to face. He couldn't miss it. Half past eleven, Ron muttered at last. Uh, we'd better go. They pulled on their dressing gowns, picked up their wands, and crept across the tower room, drowned the spiral staircase, and into the Gryffindor common room. A few embers were still glowing in the fireplace, turning all the armchairs into hunched black sh shadows. They'd almost reached the portrait hole, hole when a voice spoke from the chair nearest them. I can't believe you're going to do this, Harry. A lamp flickered on. It was Hermione Granger, wearing a pink dressing gown and a frown. Uh, dresses a different character every day. Oh, boy. Uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, is she, so she was sitting there. You, said Ron furiously, go back to bed. I almost told your brother, Hermione snapped. Percy, he's a prefect. He'd put a stop to this. Harry couldn't believe anyone could be so interfering. Come on, he said. Uh, come on, he said to Ron. Ron, he pushed open the portrait of the fat lady and climbed through the hole. Hermione wasn't going to give up that easily. She followed Ron through the portrait hole, hissing at them like an angry goose. <laughs> don't you care about Gryffindor? Do you only care about yourselves? I don't want Slytherin to win the House Cup, and you'll lose all the points I got from Professor McGonagall for knowing about switching spells. Go away. All right, but I warned you. You just remember what I said when you're at, on the train home tomorrow. You're so... But what they were, they didn't find out. Hermione had turned to the portrait of the fat lady to get back inside and found herself facing an empty painting. The fat lady had gone on a, night, a nighttime visit, and Hermione was locked out of Gryffindor's tower. Okay, so the the characters have to be in the frames for the for them to exist as doors. So we got we got uh, picture frame doors. We got sassy doors that like to uh, that like to be tickled. 
Uh, we got shifting the hallways. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, where was I? You are not sure. Bah, 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 bah. Ah, okay. Now what am I going to do? She asked shrilly. That's your problem, said Ron. We've got to go. We're going to be late. <laughs> they hadn't even reached the end of the corridor when Hermione caught up with them. I'm coming with you, she said. You are not. Do you think I'm going to stand out here and wait for Filch to catch me? If he finds all three of us, I'll tell him the truth, that I was trying to stop you, and you can back me up. You've got some nerve, said Ron loudly. Shut up, both of you, said Harry sharply. I heard something. It was a sort of suff uh, shuff snuffling. Mrs. Norris? breathed Ron, squinting through the dark. It wasn't Mrs. Norris. It was Neville. He was curled up on the floor, fast asleep, but jerked suddenly awake as they crept near. Oh, thank goodness you found me. I've been out here for hours. I couldn't remember the new password to get into bed. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's life is miserable. <laughs> like, does he have any joy? <laughs> uh, um, okay. Uh, keep your voice down, Neville. The password's pig snout, but it won't help you now. The fat lady's gone off somewhere. How's your arm? said Harry. Fine, said Neville, showing them. Madam Pomfrey mended it in about a minute. Good. Well, look, Neville, we've got to be somewhere. We'll see you later. Don't leave me, said Neville, scrambling to his feet. I don't want to stay here alone. The bloody Baron's been twice past, uh, passed twice already. Ron looked at his watch and then glared furiously at Hermione and Neville. If either of you, if, if either of you get us caught, I'll, uh, sorry, if either of you get us caught, I'll never rest until I've learned that curse of the bogey's quirrel told us about and used it on you. Hermione's op Hermione opened her mouth, perhaps to tell Ron exactly how to use the curse of the bogey's, but Harry hissed at her to be quiet and beckoned them all forward. They flitted along, along corridors, striped with bars of moonlight from the high windows. At every turn, Harry expected to run into Filch or Mrs. Norris, but they were lucky. They sped up the staircase to the third floor and tiptoed towards the trophy room. Malfoy and Crabbe weren't there yet. The crystal trophy cases glimmered where the moonlight, where the moonlight caught, caught them. Cups, shields, place, plates, and statues winked silver and gold in the darkness. They edged along the walls, keeping their eyes on the doors at either end of the room. Harry took out his wand in case Malfoy leapt in and started at once. The menace crept by. He's late. Maybe he's chickened out, Ron whispered. Then a noise in the next room made them jump. Harry had only just raised his wand when they heard someone speak, and it wasn't Malfoy. Uh, Filch, speaking to me. Filch, who was Filch again? The caretaker with the cat. Oh, like the greasy... Yeah. Uh, this. S sniff around, my sweet. They might be lurking in a corner. Something like that. You, let me know. Uh, it was Filch speaking to Mrs. Norris. Horror struck. Harry waved madly at the other three to follow him as quickly as possible. They scurried silently towards the door, uh, away from Filch's voice. Neville's robes had barely whipped around the corner when they heard Filch enter the trophy room. They're in here somewhere, they heard him mutter, probably hiding. This way, Harry mouthed to the others, and petrified, they began to creep down a long gallery full of suits and armor. They could hear Filch getting nearer. Neville suddenly let out a frightened squeak and broke into a run. Oh, Neville. He tripped, grabbed Ron around the waist, and the pair of them toppled right into a suit of armor. The clanging and clashing, crashing were enough to wake the whole castle. Run, Harry yelled, and the four of them sprinted down the gallery, not looking back to see whether Filch was following. They swung around the doorpost and galloped down one corridor, then another, Harry in the lead without any idea where they were, where they were or where they were going. They ripped through a tapestry and found themselves in a hidden passageway, hurtled along it, and came up near their charms classroom, which they knew was miles from the trophy room. I think we've lost him, Harry panted, leaning against the cold wall and wiping his forehead. Neville was bent double, wheezing and sputtering. I told you, Hermione gasped, clutching at the stitch in her chest. I told you! We've got to get back to Gryffindor Tower, said Ron, quickly as possible. 
Hermione tricked you. Hermione, uh, uh, Malfoy tricked you, Hermione said to Harry. You realize that, don't you? He was never going to meet you. Filch knew someone was going to be in the trophy room. Malfoy must have tipped him off. Harry thought that she was probably right, but he, was going to, he wasn't going to tell her that. Let's go. It wasn't going to be, uh, no, John's going to read Chamber of Secrets. Yes, that's my, uh, that's my goal. Um, that's my goal is to continue reading through all this. As, lo as long as people are interested, I'm going to keep doing it. Bogies are boogers. Oh. Okay. It wasn't going to be that simple. They hadn't gone more than a dozen paces when a doorknob rattled and something came shooting out of the classroom in front of them. It was Peeves. He caught sight of them and gave a squeal of delight. <laughs> Shut oh, uh, oh, that's somebody else. Uh, you'll get us thrown... Who's saying, who's saying shut up? Anyway. Shut up, Peeves, please. You'll get us thrown out. <laughs> Peeves cackled. Wandering around at midnight, ickle thirsties. Tut, tut, tut. Naughty, naughty. You'll get caughty. <laughs> Not if you don't give us away, P Peeves, please. Should tell Filch, I should, said Feeves in a saintly voice, but his eyes gl glittered wickedly. It's for your own good, you know. Get out of the way, snapped Ron, taking a swipe at Peeves. This was a big mistake. Students out of bed, Peeves bellowed. Students out of bed down the charms corridor. Ducking under Peeves, they ran for their lives right to the end of the corridor where they slammed into a door and it was locked. This is it, Ron moaned as they pushed helplessly at the door. We're done for. This is the end. They could hear footsteps. Filch running as... Oh, wait. Filch and Peeves... Wait. Hang on. Oh, I got... I was reading Peeves as Filch right there. Right? Filch is the, the old greasy guy. Mm -hmm. Peeves is the ghost. The, the got your conk. Got your conk. Oh, man. I missed an opportunity. Kind of want to read him again. <laughs> Uh, I'll just keep going, uh, but just, I need to remind that, remember that. They could hear footsteps, Filch running as fast as he could, could towards Peeves' shout. Oh, move over, Her Hermione snarled. She grabbed Harry's wand, tapped the lock, and whispered, Alohomara, no, Alohomora, Aloho, Alohomora, Alohomora. The lock clicked and the door swung open. They piled through it, shut it quickly, and pressed their ears against it, listening. Um, Filch. Which way did they go? Which way did they go, Peeves? Filch was saying. Quick, tell me. Uh, Got your conk. <laughs> Say please. No, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do that. Um, uh, so wait, uh, what were some adjectives for for uh, Peeves again? I completely forget. Th this is where like all the voices are getting mixed up in my head. How does what what, what would uh, Peeves sound like besides Got your conk? <laughs> Like, what does his normal voice sound? <laughs> say please. Say please. Say. Say please. No, that's that's a bit. Say please. <laughs> I can't remember Peeves. Say please. Don't mess me about, Peeves. Now, where did they go? Shan't say anything if you don't say please, said Peeves in his annoying sing-song voice. All right. Please. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Ha ha! Told you I wouldn't say nothing if you didn't say please. Ha <laughs> ha! And they heard the sound of peas whooshing away and Filch cursing in rage. Uh, he thinks this door is locked, Harry whispered. I think we'll be okay. Get off, Neville! For Neville had been tugging on the sleeve of Harry's dressing gown for the last minute. What? Harry turned around and saw quite clearly what. For a moment, he was sure he'd walked into a nightmare. This was too much on top of everything that had happened so far. They weren't in a room as he had supposed. They were in a corridor, the forbidden corridor, corridor on the third floor, and now they knew it was forbidden. They were looking straight into the eyes of a monstrous dog, a dog which filled the whole space between ceiling and floor. Holy crap. It had three heads. Is this like a, this is like from Greek mythology, isn't it? Isn't that the dog from hell? Is Hades dog? With three heads? Three pairs of rolling, mad eyes, three noses, twitching and quivering in their direction. Three drooling mouths, saliva hanging in slippery ropes from yellowish fangs. It was standing quite still, 
all six eyes staring at them, and Harry knew that the only reason they weren't already dead was that their sudden appearance had taken it by surprise, but, was, but it was quickly getting over that. There was no mistaking what those thunderous growls meant. Harry groped for the doorknob between Filch and Death. He'd take Filch. They fell backwards. Harry slammed the door shut, and they ran. They almost flew back down the corridor. Filch must have hurried off to look for them somewhere else, because they didn't see him anywhere. But they hardly cared. All they wanted to do was put as much space as possible between that, them and that monster. They didn't stop running until they reached the portrait of the fat lady on the seventh floor. Inspired by Greek mythology. Yeah, I thought so. I remember this, um... I, I thought that this that he was from... Yeah, he's, he's Hades' dog, I'm pretty sure. Um, where... Oh, wait, the fat lady on the seventh floor. Where on earth have you all been? She asked, looking at their dressing gowns hanging off their shoulders and their flushed, sweaty fa faces. Never mind that. Pig snout, pig snout, panted Harry, and the portrait sw swung forward. Oh, okay. I thought he was calling her pig snout. <laughs> Very uncharacteristic, Harry. Uh, they scrambled into the common room. Uh, they scrambled into the common room and collapsed, trembling into armchairs. It was a while before any of them said anything. Neville, indeed, looked as if he'd never spoke, speak again. What do they think they're doing, keeping a thing like that locked up in a school? Said Ron finally. If any dog needs exercise, that one does. Hermione had got both her breath and her bad temper back again. You don't use your eyes, any of you, do you? She snapped. Didn't you see that, what it was standing on? The floor, Harry suggested. It wasn't looking at its feet. I was too busy with its heads. I, was, I wasn't looking at its feet. I was too busy with its heads. No, not the floor. It was standing on a trap door. It's obviously guarding something. She stood up, glaring at them. I hope you're pleased with yourselves. We could all, we could all have been killed, or worse, expelled. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to bed. Ron stared after her, his mouth open. No, we don't mind, he said. You'd think we dragged her along, wouldn't you? But Hermione had given Harry something else to think about as he climbed back into bed. The dog was guarding something. What had, what had Hagrid said? Gringotts was the safest place in the world for something he wanted to hide, except perhaps Hogwarts. It looked as though Harry had found out where the grubby little package from Vault 713 was. End of chapter. I'll, uh, I'll go two more, uh, two more minutes, or three more minutes. Chapter 10, Halloween. Malfoy couldn't believe his eyes when he saw that Harry and Ron were still at Hogwarts next day, looking tired, but perfectly cheerful. Hey, buddy, you just made a little noise. Indeed, by next morning, Harry and Ron thought the, that meeting the three-headed dog had been an excellent adventure, and they were quite keen to have another one. In the meantime, Harry filled Ron in about the package that seemed to have been moved from Gringotts to Hogwarts, and they spent a lot and they spent a lot of time wondering what could possibly need such heavy protection. It's either really valuable or really dangerous, said Ron. Or both, said Harry. But as as they all knew for sure about but as all they knew for sure about the mysterious object was that it was about two inches long. They didn't have much chance of guessing what it was without further clues. Neither Neville or Hermione showed the slightest interest in what lay underneath the dog and the trapdoor. All Neville cared about was never going near the dog again. Hermione was now refusing to speak to Harry and Ron, but she was such a bossy know-it-all that they saw this as an added bonus. All they really wanted now was, was a way of getting back at Malfoy, and to their great delight, just such a thing arrived with the post about a week later. As the owls flooded into the great hall as usual, everyone's attention was caught at once by a long, thin package carried by six large screech owls. Harry was just as interested as everyone else to see what was in this large parcel and was amazed when the owl soared down and dropped it right in front of him, knocking his bacon to the floor. And I'm going to finish there. That's a good point to finish. Uh, leaving some time for interaction and uh, Q&A before we wrap up. Any questions, uh, any observations? I'm um, liking these midnight ex exploits. No, <laughs> that's, that's not the right word. A little uh, midnight adventures. Uh, the team is forming, the team of the three that I know that existed because you see them on all the posters together. 
Uh, hey, Julian. Good to see you, man. Uh, thank you, Sophia. Better view of Dexter, please. <laughs> there he is. There's a little Dexy. I just don't want to pick him up. And Well, well it's too late. Uh, what inspired you to read Harry Potter? Everybody kept on telling me, you got to read it. Why, you haven't re read it? So that was pretty much it. What do you think is going to happen? Um, they're going to go underneath the trapdoor, that's for sure. Otherwise, it'd be a wasted opportunity. What's your favorite, favorite character now? Any changes? No, it's still uh, it's still Hagrid, and uh, I think I do like, I got your conk, only because it's fun to say. I don't know anything about that character. Uh, do you look forward to this every day? Yeah, you know, amongst everything that's happening, this is like a great, uh, this, is, this is bringing great structure to my day, because as you know, the days blend into each other, so it's something I'm looking forward to. Uh, another good evening. So much fun. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Okay. Uh, unless there's any other questions, uh, I say. Uh, oh, actually, a couple of things. Don't forget at seven o'clock. Uh, at least here in Vancouver, this is what we're doing. Applaud all your uh, your healthcare workers, nurses, doctors, anybody who's helping out nowadays. There's a uh, everybody's just applauding out their windows. So don't forget to do that. Right after this, um, Vancouver Theatre Sports is doing uh, something live for, for, I think, an hour or two. So look at Vancouver uh, Theatre Sports. Uh, Andrew Barber will be doing that there. Uh, don't forget to submit a name for this thing that we can, uh, f that we can uh, decide on. And uh, stop the music. <laughs> okay. But maybe, uh, maybe people are a big fan of the music. Oh, and follow Mark. What's your, what's your, uh, oh. hashtag? Uh, YOC.creations. YOC creations. Follow Mark too. It's a character you feel relate to the most. Um, oh gosh. Remind me again tomorrow. I have to think about that one. Yeah. Oh, Norm loves the music. Okay. Thanks everybody. Have a good evening. I'll see you tomorrow at six. Thank you again for tuning in. Uh, tell other people about this. Uh, I'm, I'm having lots of fun with you. See you later. Bye.